Good morning. It's good to see you. We are glad that you are here. All right, Jay. There we go. It's not freezing. I thought it was. You just got to push it right. Ben Franklin was a noted writer, statesman, inventor. Came up with just many different things. Franklin realized that Philadelphia, when it got dark, was dark. And that folks sometimes stumbled along on their way home and had difficulty getting home because they were having difficulty finding points of origin. And so in Franklin's mind, what Philadelphia needed was some lights in the city. And so he came up with an idea, but the city fathers were not too hip on the idea. So Franklin just went out and he advised or devised a device much like what you see uh, here on the screen, in which there were four windows, clear windows, around a candle. And each night, Franklin would go out, he'd put this in his yard, he'd go out and he'd light his candle in his yard. It wasn't too long before folks began to realize the value of this candle. Folks could see, at least in that part of the world, they could see what was going on and they would not stumble in front of his home. They saw the value of it from the standpoint that it was it became sort of a, a focal point where they could get a point of reference on their way home. It became so attractive as well and appealing that folks in the neighborhood began to erect their own pole with the the candle in the middle of four panes of glass. And each night they'd light a candle and more and more of the community started doing it until Philadelphia became a city that was well lit at night. We today still benefit <coughs> from Franklin's forethought and knowledge. City street lights are eventually what has come out of what Franklin started. It's all because a man wanted to touch and make better a world. And he had within his hand and within his palm, if you will, the impact that he made upon his world, first of all. And then not only upon his world, but upon the world in general, an impact for good. And as we think about making an impact for good, we think about this being Mother's Day. And Happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers. And Happy Grandmother's Day to all of our grandmothers. You say, there's not a Grandmother's Day. Well, actually, there is. It's September the 12th. But we honor you today as well. Women in the Bible hold a special, special place. Some were mothers and some, we don't know if they were mothers or not. But they also wanted to affect the world and they all had great impact upon the world which was around them, just like Franklin. They moved the world. They moved much the world, as a matter of fact, that there was an article that was written early on in the colonization of the United States in which a reporter went to Philadelphia and when he got there, he wanted to study the family. He wanted to see the effects of the family in society. And when he did, he wrote an article, and in, or wrote several articles actually, but one of the articles made this statement, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. That's a statement that is still used by many of us today. Why? It's because the impact of ladies upon our society, the impact upon our being by those that we know and those that we love. There is in the Bible, there is an interesting lady, a lady by the name of Dorcas. If you have your Bibles, you might want to turn there. It's Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 36. Some of you Bible scholars may say, Preacher, I thought her name was Tabitha. Well, it was. That was her Hebrew name. Her Greek name was Dorcas. I'm going to call her Dorcas because that's what I grew up always calling her when I talked about this story. But Dorcas, or Tabitha, was a lady that 
really in many ways touches the world and made an impact. There's our word for the day, an impact upon others. And how did she do that? Well, let's get the background of Acts chapter 9, and then we'll look at her story specifically. In Acts chapter 9, Luke, writing that great account of the history of the church, is spending time talking about Peter. Matter of fact, you pick up with Peter about Acts uh, chapter 2, and you get carry through at least Acts chapter 10, maybe just a little bit later on. Peter was one of the first, if you will, prime movers and shakers within the church. Peter was, according to Acts chapter 9, Peter was going up and down Galilee, Judea, and Samaria, what we would call uh, Palestine. And he was going from place to place, community to community, and he had gone to Lydda. Lydda was a community in which he served and served well, but there was a man by the name of Aeneas who uh, sick and died. And yet Peter healed him. When Peter healed him, word got out, and all it said, all of Lydda was eventually converted to the cause of Christ. Word got out. Because you see, in Joppa, Joppa is a coastal community right there upon the sea. It was a community not far from Lydda. That word got out that, that Dorcas had died. And they wanted Peter to come, and they wanted Peter to raise her from the dead. You see, his fame had spread abroad, and they wanted Peter, come and do what you did in Lydda. Come and do it here in Joppa. And so they sent out to go get him. And when he did, he came to this lady's house, a lady, as we said, by the name of Dorcas, Dorcas' impact begins, first of all, in verse 36, where it just simply says that Dorcas was a disciple of the Lord. The word disciple is interesting. We often think of it as a learner or a follower. Well, it has all of that, but it basically when we think of the word disciple, it has really two components to it. The first component is that of a pupil. A disciple is someone, first of all, that listens to what is being taught. It's an individual that sits at the feet of an individual and listens to, to what they have to say. We are all, to a degree, we're all pupils or disciples in many ways, but pupils of individuals. Maybe it was our mom and dad. Maybe it was a teacher in school. I know that there were a couple of individuals that, when I went off to college, that I really tried to take every class they taught because there was so much in the classes that was of value. And in many ways, you could say, well, Paul, you became a disciple of theirs. Well, in many ways, yes. But a pupil, one that studies, one that listens to what is being said. But a disciple also is a follower. It's not just a pupil, not just one that listens, but one that is willing and ready and able and follows that teacher. Dorcas is a disciple. She's a follower of the Lord. She made an impact upon others because the Lord had made an impact upon her life. We think about as Christians, we're all disciples, you might say, I'm a Christian, yes, by all means. But you're also a follower of Jesus Christ. You should be a pupil of Jesus Christ, shouldn't we? We're to be individuals that are in the Word, and we live by the Word. She was probably in the Word as much as what she had. We today have far greater means, if you will, from the standpoint of the Bible itself than she did because we have it in the form of 66 books all together. God planned on us searching this word. In Isaiah, the 34th chapter, Isaiah says in verse 16, seek out the word. Seek out the word and, and read it. 
find out what it says. As Christians, we should always remember that the Word is not just something that we bring to church on Sunday or bring to church for Bible study, but it's something that we're in. And so we're in the Word, but we're of the Word. The Hebrew writer reminded us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, what we studied Wednesday night in class, that, these, that it talks about those who did not were not able to enter in because of their unbelief, talking about children of Israel going into to the land of promise, and they didn't get to enter in, some of them didn't. Why? Because of their unbelief. Well, where did they fail, or what was the failure? Was it the word? Was it the leaders? No, the Hebrew writer says it was because the gospel preached unto them did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith. As disciples, as followers of Christ, as Christians, it's one thing to to be in the Word, but then it's another to be of the Word. You are my disciples, Jesus said, if you do what? If you keep my commandments, John 8 and verse 31. You see, we, we need to be folks that are disciples of the Lord, followers of the Lord, listening to the Lord, walking as the Lord walked, believing in the Lord. Paul reminds us that we're to walk even as he walked, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8, that we walk worthy of the Lord and all things pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 10. Our Thoughts are to be of God. And we need to be directed by Him. Dorcas impacted the world. Why? Because Dorcas studied this Word. Two little boys. One was visiting. The other was with his grandmother. And they were playing out in the yard. Grandmother kept the little boy on a daily basis. and, And the little boy finally said to his friend that was visiting, he said, you know, he said, my grandmother reads her Bible all the time. And the visitor said, well, why do you think that's so? And he said, well, the best I got figured out is she's cramming for finals. Well, we need to cram for finals, don't we? And I think Dorcas made an impact upon folks because she was a disciple. She was an individual of the Word. But then secondly, Dorcas was kind. Something we get in verse 36 is interesting because, you see, let's look at the story. Dorcas dies. And when Dorcas dies, what happens? As they're going to get Peter, folks are bringing things together. They're preparing her, as we'll talk about in just a few minutes. They prepare her basically for burial. They have her sitting up or in her room laid out. And yet the folks are gathered together. And as they gather together and as Peter gets there, they're showing her things, showing him things that she's made. But verse 36 sets us up for that because verse 36 tells us that she was what? She was a lady of good works and charitable deeds. Now, good works is just what we think of. Good works. She was, she was a lady that, that was busy. She was a lady that was, was working. She did good for others. But the word charitable deeds is interesting. It's the idea of helping those that didn't have. We think of charity much the same way, don't we? Charity is giving to those or helping those or extending some kind of relief or or, or help to those individuals that don't have much or anything. Now, what we don't know about Dorcas is, is we don't know if she had children or not. We do not know if she's married or not. Scriptures don't tell us. We can only assume and we can only guess, and so we're not going to do that. But we are going to say this, is that if she were single, remember there were no social programs in first century times. And so what little she had was just that, little. Whatever she had, she helped others. And so Luke, in his account, talking about Dorcas is that she is a lady of good works and she is a lady of charitable 
deeds. She's kind. She's kind to those that are in need. She feels compassion towards those that have a need. Now, yes, not everybody that claims they have a need has a need. That's true. But at the same point in time, too, those that we know have a need. But let's be, go beyond the individual that thinks that they have nothing or the individual that has almost nothing. But let's think about our friends and our folks that have had jobs, maybe retired, still living comfortably. Maybe they could live better, but living comfortably, they still need kindness too, don't they? Well, Paul would remind us in Ephesians chapter 4 that we're to be kind one to another. That kindness comes from our heart and we have an impact upon others by, by offering kindness. You see, we're to be rich in good works, doing good. That's what the Hebrew writer reminds us in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 16. That's what Paul said, almost the same thing in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 18. To be kind, to be good. To be kind and, and good to, to those that have a need. Why? Because there are folks that, that truly have needs. We all do. Don't you like to see the sunshine? And don't you like to see the sunshine on people's faces? Yet we all weather storms from time to time, don't we? We all go through heartaches. We all go through tragedies. We all go through grief. We all go through problems. We all go through pain. That's one of them. Just kidding. But the, but the truth is, is that we need to be kind to others. That we need to help others. Little boy that just loved, we talked about the little boy last week that loved to watch the, the street sweeper come up. Well, this same little boy decided one day that he was going to do something good for the street sweeper. And so when the street sweeper came up, he flagged him down, and the street sweeper stopped, got out of his vehicle, and asked the little boy what he wanted. And he said, he said I, I just want to give you something. And he produced a piece of paper, and in it, on, or on it, rather, was a beautiful painting or picture or color of the machine that the man drove. And beside the machine was the street sweeper and a little boy standing side by side. And he said, the little boy said to the man, he said, you're my friend, and I just wanted to share this with you. That's kindness. You see, kindness doesn't always have to be something big. Kindness can be something small. It can be a card. It can be a phone call. It can be uh, simply a pat on the back. It can be a smile. Now, if you want to do something big for me, that's fine. I'm not going to stop you. But the reality of it is, is that it doesn't always have to be. Dorcas was kind. She was helpful to others. She saw that folks had a need. And so she wanted to make an impact upon them. And she made an impact upon them, not by being rough and gruff, but by being kind. One of the things that I knew I would have to adjust when I moved to Nashville from Dixon was the difference in city mentality. You know what city mentality is? Y'all all probably got it and don't even realize it. It's you drive like this, and you don't know how to wave. Right? And when you go through the store, you don't speak to anybody. And if you look at them, you look at them mean because you don't want them to touch you. Now, that's city mentality. I'm a country boy. I was raised like a country boy. I, now, now, to be honest, I was raised inside city limits. Suzanne was raised out in the country. The only thing they had out there was sunshine that was piped in twice a week. That's how far out she lived. But I was raised as a country boy. So I, if you see me and you say, well, how does he know that person? Why is he? Well, it's just something I do. Now, I know some of you are thinking, preacher, you're going to end up in trouble because somebody's going to mistake that. Uh, uh, I've got a cautious streak about me, and i got a mean streak about me. But at the same time, too, I can just stand in my yard and watch people, and I'm talking about staying close to the road and watch people, and I'll 
Throw up a hand. We need more Dorcases that are kind. That's how we impact the world. But then a third idea and a third point with regards to Dorcas is, is that she used what she could. In many ways, probably I should have said she used what she had, but she used what she could. She used a needle and thread. Now, like I said, she didn't have social programs. What she did have, though, was a needle and thread. And when she died, what happened? They brought clothes, and they began to show, and they showed Peter, oh, look what she made. Look look what she gave my son. Look what she made for my daughter. Look what she made for me. Look at this. Look at that. She used what she had at her disposal to impact the world. That's what we need to learn. You see, as we said a while ago, we often think it's the big things that we need. Do you remember? Do you remember a certain individual in the Bible coming and wanting to know what he can do to be cured and the prophet telling him to go wash in the rivers of Jordan and he got upset? Why, the rivers of Abner and Farpar are far better, are cleaner, they're better than the Jordan River. And when he finally was talked out of his fit, you remember what his servant told him? He said, if the Lord had bid you do some great thing, you would have done it, wouldn't you? And immediately that humbled him, and he realized, oh yeah, I would have. Now, here's the thing. Let's understand that a dollar is sometimes as good and important as a hundred. That a minute sometimes is just as good and just as important as 60 minutes. That 30 seconds sometimes is as good as a minute. And sometimes you can ruin good days with 30 seconds, so be careful. But we have to remember to, to use what we have. In Matthew chapter 25, there's the parable of the talents. We know, I'm sure, that story real well. Five talents, two talents, and one talent. That's what a man gave three different individuals. He gave one five, one two, and one one. The five talent man gained five talents and was blessed. The two talent man gained two talents and was blessed. The one talent man, you remember what he did? He went and he hid his talent. And he came back and he had one talent. He had what he had been given. We commend him for that. Right? I do. You may not. I do. He didn't lose what he was given. But here's the thing. He didn't do anything with what he was given either. Remember what he said? He said, I was afraid. And I went and I hid my talent. I've seen a lot of folks through my years of preaching that didn't have much. Maybe they didn't have much money, or maybe they didn't have much with regards to abilities. And I've watched them hide their talent, if you will. Why? Because it was so little in comparison to others. And they failed to realize that they were fulfilling this very story, this very parable in the Bible. The one talent man is condemned, not because he had one talent. Remember, the story sets up itself in the very beginning. Each man was given his talents. Go back and read it, Matthew 25, according to his ability. In other words, the five talent man was given five talents because he, the master, thought that this man could, con could control and could work with five talents. He didn't give him just one. He gave him five because he had that ability. He didn't give the one talent man that was received one talent. He didn't give him five. Why? Because the Lord didn't think he could, he could master that. But he could handle one. But he didn't. Why? I was afraid, he said. And I went and I hid my talent. Yeah, I brought it back. But what was he condemned for? Not using what he had. If you'd only put it to use. 
There's the key. Do what you can with what you have. In Exodus, God is calling Moses. Moses, I want you to go and I want you to lead my, my children. I want you to lead them out to the promised land. Moses says, huh? Not me. Moses makes all the excuses he can in the world. No, Lord, don't want to do this. No, Lord, I'm not able to do this. No, Lord, I can't speak it. God provides for him everything. And finally, he says, you know, Lord, who am I that he's going to listen, that Pharaoh's going to listen? And so God, in making the point, says, what's in your hand? A rod? Throw it down. And so he does, and it becomes a serpent. God says, pick it up. I'm sorry, that's where he has faith. Because I'm thinking, I could have thrown it down, but Lord, I'm not picking that thing up. But anyway, he picks it up. When he picks it up, it becomes rod. God told Moses, or asked Moses, what is in your hand? That's the same question in many ways that can be asked in the parable of the talents. What's in your hand? That's the same question that we're asked every day. What's in your hand? What's in your ability? Joan of Arc, French leader in the late 1300s, early 1400s, died 1425, I believe. Joan of Arc was, as we said, a French leader in the insurrection. She had led the folk. She had led them brilliantly. She had led them gallantly. They had loved her. They had adored her. They had followed her. But she realized that she was coming close to the end of her life. Her enemy was really right outside the door. And she realized that. And she knew that when her enemy overtook her folks and overtook her home, that she would be killed. And so, as history tells us, she went into the chambers of her room. She closed the door. And she said, Lord, I have but a little time, and I only you know how long. Take me and use me as you see fit. That should be our prayer. Lord, take me and use me. Use what I have. Use not only what I have, but, but what, I, what I've got. And, and, and use me. And let me make an impact on the world. Dorcas made an impact upon the world because she used what she had. But Dorcas also was loved and respected by others. While they were out getting Peter after she'd passed away, they prepared her body. Friends brought things that reminded them of her. And, and can't you, I, I just hear, I just hear that room. If you've ever been at visitation and funeral home, you understand the difference between a good person and a sorry person passing away. A good person, you hear folks sit around and talk and tell stories about them, about this thing that they did and that thing that they did and how they got in trouble over here and how, how they got in trouble over there and when you laughed and when you cried together. But the sorry person, people walk in, pay their respects, walk out, and hardly anything is said. Dorcas is a lady that's loved, and she is respected by others. It reminds us of, of us as well that we need to be folks that, as Peter reminded us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19, that we're to have a good conscience, that when they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be, disha- may be ashamed. We want folks to be ashamed if they talk evil of us, because we want to be loved and respected. We want to be caring and kind. We want to make an impact upon them. Why? Because isn't that what Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5? No man lights a candle and puts it under a bushel basket, but puts it on a lampstand or a lampstick so that it can do what? So that it can shine throughout the room. And therefore, Jesus says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. That they may see what you're doing and you have made an impact then upon them for 
good. That's what we want. We want to make an impact upon others for what is good. How do we go about making an impact upon others? I think we go back to the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a wonderful, wonderful book. When we start back in in July, the elders have asked me to to lead the auditorium class. And we're going to study the book of Nehemiah because it talks about, I think, what we've gone through as a society recently. It talks about a time of going away, but a time of coming back and a time of rebuilding. It's so apropos to what the church is facing right now. But in Nehemiah, on two occasions, Nehemiah asked God, remember me for good. Remember me for the good things that I have done. Well, Nehemiah could be remembered for the good things that he had done. Why? Because he made an impact. And if you don't believe that or can't remember it, go back and study the book of Nehemiah. Be with us as we start Bible classes in July. But we do all of this for what? Well, whatever you do in word or deed, Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, do all the glory of God. This morning, you might say, well, the Lord has made an impact upon my life, and I truly thank him for it. And he did. He came and he died on the cross for us. And so this morning, if you're not a New Testament child of God, or you're an individual that needs to, to rededicate your life, what a great day to do it, Mother's Day. Won't you come? All together we stand and sing.